Hello everybody and welcome back for another exciting week of marketing. Uh, this week we are going to be continuing our discussion of price, the price P. And uh, this is chapter 15 about strategic pricing methods. This kind of builds on what we talked about last week with uh, chapter 14 in pricing as well. I will say this is one of my favorite chapters in your entire book, and I think you're really going to enjoy it. Um, we're going to talk this week a lot about some different methods we can be using for developing pricing strategies. Uh, one of those methods is the, I always mess this up when I say it, I always slur my words together, it is the cost-based methods strategy. Got that out. That's good. We also have the competition-based methods strategy and then the value-based methods. So as we look at these, we're going to look at each one individually. The cost-based pricing um, is exactly what it sounds like. You are uh, just kind of thinking about what it's going to cost for your product and then kind of marking it up a little bit. So um, an example here if you think about for your for your product, whatever it is, you have some fixed costs that you're going to incur of about two hundred thousand dollars, and then you maybe have some variable costs of about a hundred thousand. And if you know you're going to produce thirty thousand units, you can mathematically figure out exactly how much you're going to need to um, charge in order to break even. We talked about last week a little the break even analysis and all of that. That's kind of what you're doing here in cost based pricing. You're you're determining uh, how much you would need to spend in order to um, break even and then you're adding a markup of whatever percentage in this case it's 20 percent so if it's gonna cost me ten dollars per item and I need a 20 percent markup I'm gonna need to charge uh, twelve dollars this twelve dollars is what we call the cost plus price again super creative people in marketing right the cost plus the price okay so I think this is one of our um, simpler methods of pricing it's a little uh, easy to understand, typically not too difficult. Um, the really sort of negative point of cost-based pricing is that all of these processes really assume that the cost is not going to vary at different levels of production, um, and that's that's kind of a concern. So if your costs do vary based on production, you might need to adjust this accordingly, but it works well for some products. Um, Moving on to competition-based uh, pricing strategies and pricing methods, um, this is exactly what it sounds like as well. We try to price very close to a competitor's price. Um, when we do this, it usually signifies that our products are very similar. Um, so in some ways, this can be a good or a bad thing as well. Really, we use competition-based pricing um, in different ways, and we want to do this to sort of help consumers interpret our, our goods and our items. So again, if if our prices are very similar to our competitors, they're going to think, oh, these products are similar. Maybe they're substitutes, right? Whereas if we set our price a lot higher than our competition, oh man, this product must be a whole lot better. It's a lot more expensive. Or if we're a lot lower, oh, this might be a lower price, lower quality product, right? So competition-based methods have pros and cons. Um, we also have what we call the value-based pricing methods, and these are really fun, actually. Um, this is where we set our prices that really focus on the overall value of the product um, from the eyes of the consumer, okay? So we really determine this value by comparing our benefits uh, to the product uh, with the sacrifice they're going to need to make in order to acquire this product. And uh, there's some subsets here we're going to talk about. Uh, two methods of value-based pricing are we have the improvement value method and we also have uh, the cost of ownership method. So starting out with this improvement value, uh, we're looking at kind of the estimate of how much more or maybe how much less, but usually how much more consumers are willing to pay for a product relative to another comparable product. And the best example I could think of to give you for this was the iPhone. Okay, so think about like the iPhone 8 versus the iPhone 10. Okay. Is the iPhone 10 really worth that much more? And if they're on the market at the same time, how do we determine how much more we can charge for that iPhone 10? Well, we have um, a little table here for improvement value where you can figure this out. Um, and, and think about we're talking about a cell phone here, uh, two of these smartphones, again, maybe the iPhone 8 and the iPhone 10 or uh, whatever number we're on now. Um, so maybe you assign 
you look at something like battery life and you say, oh gosh, the battery life of the iPhone 10 is 5% better than the battery life was for the iPhone 8, okay, 5% better. Um, but security, oh my gosh, it's 10% more secure and 30% easier to use here, okay? So we, we look at the improved value. How much did um, the iPhone 10 improve from the iPhone 8, right? And then we assign a weight, a, a weight of importance for us, okay? Uh, how important is battery life? Oh gosh, it's 20%. I want that battery. I want that 5% of battery longer, okay? So it's, it's 20%, whereas security, eh, Nobody's breaking into my phone. I don't have anything they're going to care about. It's only 10%. Um, in ease of use, eh, I know how to work a smartphone. It's okay. So we multiply all these out. Multiplying straight across, you get a weighted factor. And we, we sum or add together all of these weighted factors and get 21%. So this is how you can determine how much more to charge. Because if your iPhone 8 was only $100, um, we know that the iPhone 10 is 21% better um, Based on our, our mathematical calculations here, we know that the iPhone 10 is 21% better. So again, if our iPhone 8 was $100, we multiply by 1.21, accounting for that 21% increase, and we get $121. That's how much we can charge, about $21 more. Okay. Um, we also have what we call the cost of ownership method. And I think this resonates with a lot of people, and I can't help but think about light bulbs. So this is the example that I gave you here. But um, backing up a little bit, this cost of ownership method really just determines the total cost of owning the product over its useful life. So you think about a conventional light bulb. I'm all the time leaving lights on in my house, particularly lights outside. Um, and you know, you think a conventional light bulb is supposed to last about 1,500 hours and you pay $1 for your cheapo light bulb, okay? Or you can buy an LED light bulb which lasts 6,000 hours and it costs anywhere from three to four dollars. So hey, this might be a better value. You know, you do the math, I need to buy four conventional light bulbs uh, to last 6,000 hours, that's four dollars. Well, if I can buy an LED bulb for only uh, three dollars that's going to last six thousand hours. I'm, um, it's working a little better over its entire lifetime. It's eventually going to cost less to own that LED light bulb, which might be a little more expensive up front, uh, but it's it's in the end going to be a cheaper alternative to that conventional light bulb. So this is our cost of ownership method. Okay. Now the problem with value-based pricing is that it really necessitates a whole whole lot of consumer research and mainly just because um, you know we talked about how consumers are really unpredictable and how it's difficult to um, manage consumers because of that heterogeneity of services well same thing here the way that consumers perceive value today may be very different than the way they perceive value tomorrow you know we value one thing today and we might not value that thing tomorrow it might be less important to us so this value-based pricing is really kind of hit or miss Okay, so these are our three broad pricing strategies that you're going to be applying this week in your discussion board. Again, you have cost-based pricing, competition-based pricing, and value-based pricing. So I hope you feel a little better about how all those work. Um, so moving on a little bit here, we're going to talk about pricing strategies. Uh, the definition of a pricing strategy from your book is a long-term approach to setting prices very broadly in an integrative effort across all the firm's products. And we base this on the five C's, the company objectives, cost, customers, competition, and channel members of pricing. So to make this a little simpler for you, um, I always like to take what the book says and kind of expound on it a little bit in these videos. I hope these are helpful to you. Um, we're going to talk about some common pricing strategies, starting with everyday low pricing. And um, everyday low pricing is exactly what it sounds like. This is where companies kind of stress that their prices are always somewhere between the regular non-sale price and the really deep, deep discount prices that their competitors may offer. Uh, so this is where you know you're always going to go and you're going to get an everyday low price, just like it sounds like um, here in the United States, we typically think, oh, Walmart, everyday low price, it's always going to be cheaper there, Let, let's go there, you know, everyday low pricing. Um, high low pricing is a different pricing strategy. And this is really interesting because it allows us to target two distinct market segments. Um, and high-low pricing is where you know 
at, at certain times the price is going to be high, or it's, it's normal price, whereas at other times there's going to be a flash sale, there's going to be a promotion, and those prices are temporarily, temporarily reduced in order to encourage purchases. So um, I said we can target two market segments, and uh, I say that because during times when prices are high, that regular price, you have those people who maybe aren't as price sensitive, they don't really care about the price, they're going to go ahead and pay that high price and get the product that they want now. Whereas you have another market segment who says, oh no, I want the sale price, I'm going to wait. And it sort of creates a sense of excitement for a get it while it lasts type thing uh, that helps to um, encourage excitement and uh, encourage customers to want to buy immediately. Um, so you'll see a picture here of a Black Friday advertisement. You have some people who say, oh my gosh, you could not pay me to get in those Black Friday lines, no way. And they're going to go ahead and pay that higher price. But then you have those people who wait all year, oh my gosh, I know I need to buy a TV, I'm going to wait until Black Friday, I'm going to get it when it's $300 cheaper, and I'm going to stand in that line at midnight to get it. You know. Um, so again, high-low pricing. Um, so when we talk about high-low pricing, we talk about what's called a reference price, and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself here, but the reference price is the original high price, uh, really sometimes referred to as the original price or the regular price. There's no discount or percentage off or anything applied here. It's just the regular price, um, whereas the low price is typically the sale price that does include that percentage off or it does include a certain dollar amount off. There's actually a law that says if you practice this high-low pricing, you you must have that regular reference priced um, as the cost of the item for at least 50% of the time, okay? So I don't know about you, one of my favorite stores is Kohl's, and it seems like every time I go into Kohl's, something is always on sale. You know, they always have those little signs, oh, 50% off or 40% off. It seems like, man, do you ever charge that regular price for your product? Like, really? Well, by law, uh, they do, <laughs> because all all products have to serve, um, they have to provide that cost at the regular $39.99 or $59.99 or whatever. They can't always sell it at $17.99 and advertise it as being on sale all the time, okay? So that's one condition of high-low pricing, but I included this advertisement here from Kohl's just to let you kind of see the difference in, um, you know, the $17.99, that is your low pricing, that's your sale price, whereas this regular $39.99 to $59.99, whatever, that's your high price uh, or your regular or original reference price. It's become to be known, okay? Um, Lastly, we're going to talk about new product pricing strategies, and there's two that we really see a lot. That's penetration pricing and also market skimming. Uh, penetration pricing, exactly what it sounds like. We want to penetrate the market, uh, meaning that we're probably going to set a really low initial price as we introduce the product. Okay, And here, we're focused more on building sales, building market share, deterring competitors from entering the market, and maybe making a really quick profit. Okay, um, and over time, as our sales grow with this penetration pricing, as we develop um, the volume, the costs sort of continue to drop over time. So this can be very successful, but there are some downsides as well to penetration pricing. One of those being that um, you know you see a low price that doesn't always indicate. Um, quality. So you see a low price and you think, oh gosh, maybe it's kind of junky and maybe it's not good quality. You know, I don't know. Um, the other thing here is that firms that implement this penetration pricing have been known by researchers to, um, to be leaving money on the table, meaning that there are certain segments of the market, like those high price people, that are not as sensitive to pricing, that might be willing to go ahead and pay a, a, you know, a larger sum of money to acquire your product now. So that's kind of a downside. You might be leaving a little money on the table. The other thing is just basic supply and demand. You know, if you have a really low price and your company's only prepared, uh, let's say you're talking about the iPhone. If you have a really low price, you're selling iPhone 10s for $100 and you only planned on selling 1 million of them, but then you sell 5 million. If your company's not um, ready to accommodate that rise in demand, um, or at least be able to add that capacity quickly, this can really be uh, a problem with penetration pricing. So that's something to consider. Um, okay, so again, our other new product pricing strategy is price skimming. 
And this is sort of exactly what it sounds like. This is this really appears to your innovators and your early adopters, if you remember from a previous week on the discussion of innovation, the division of innovation. Um, this price skimming is where a product may start out really, really high in price, um, and then they may sell all that they can. And once the market segment starts to become saturated and sales start to fall, companies slowly lower the price with the goal of capturing or skimming the next most price sensitive market uh, to kind of target uh, what they're willing to pay next, usually at a lower price. Okay, so this is very common in the technology industry where people will wait in line all night just to be the first person to get a product and usually pay this outrageous price for that as well. Um, so again, oh, and I have a picture here of a Black Friday line where people are maybe not even Black Friday, maybe just this is um, the the iPhones coming out, the iPhone 11 or whatever, and people are waiting in line for it. Um, but again, this is where our price starts out really high. As the market becomes saturated and sales begin to slow down, companies will skim the market to try to get people who are a little more price sensitive, who want the product but want to pay a lower price for it. Um, just like with other things, we have a, uh, some positives and some negatives about price skimming. Uh, one of the positives is that um, you know the price does start out high and that usually does signify a higher quality. Um, it allows us to test consumers' price sensitivity to see just what they're willing to pay because, after all, you can always price your product too high and then lower the price, but you can't really price your product low and then raise the price. That usually uh, causes us to encounter a lot of resistance from consumers. So that's something to think about. Um, the other thing is that having a high price allows us to limit our demand so we don't run into those supply problems that we had from before. Um, you know, if you have a high price, only so many people can pay that really high price immediately. Um, it also allows us to earn back some lost costs in R&D. So all some things to consider here. Some of the negatives of price skimming is that um, usually there's typically a high cost, a high unit cost associated with producing small volumes of products. Um, and there's also a trade-off between earning a higher price and suffering those higher production costs. I think the most important thing here to consider is that those customers who really paid that higher initial price, when they see the cost drop with price skimming, they're gonna go, oh my gosh, why did I not wait and buy it when it was cheaper? Oh, I should have just waited. And next time they might do just that. So there's some pros and some cons with price skimming. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about price Tactics. Bear in mind, we've been talking about pricing strategies, okay? So we're changing gears here. We're talking about pricing tactics, and we're going to talk about the difference in those in a second. But a pricing tactic is more of a short-term method designed to focus on select components of the five Cs. Uh, it's a very short-term response, usually targeting a more competitive threat, uh, usually temporarily lowering prices. Um, so again, Temporary, short-term pricing tactics, okay? Um, we also have pricing tactics that target only consumers and some that target um, other businesses. And we'll talk about how those are different in just a moment. But one more time, pricing tactics are short-term approaches that focus on select components of the five Cs, whereas pricing strategies are your more long-term approaches to setting prices broadly. Um, and we usually focus here in a more integrative effort across all the firm's products, usually looking at all five of the C's, okay? Whereas again, a pricing tactic is probably just looking at one of the C's, maybe two, and it's a short-term approach, okay? So in your discussion board this week, you're gonna be talking about both of these things, pricing strategy and pricing tactics. So make sure you know the difference. Up until this point, we've been talking about pricing strategies. Now we're gonna talk about pricing tactics, okay? Um, these are the pricing tactics that are aimed at consumers, um, and we're going to look at each one of these individually, starting with markdowns. Um, markdowns are just basic reductions that retailers will take off of the initial selling price of a product or a service. Um, usually, markdowns are used to increase sales, but also to increase traffic with certain products. We typically see these when you want to get rid of that slower moving merchandise or maybe obsolete merchandise. Maybe you want to get rid of some seasonal items after that season has passed. Um, so I put a picture here of some 
Halloween candy. You see this with all the holidays. This is when I always like to buy my Reese cups, my favorite candy. You know, at Easter and Christmas, I always go and look for all the discounted Reese cups and try to clear out the candy aisles. So um, those are markdowns. We're all familiar with those. The other thing we see for consumers is a quantity discount, also commonly known as a size discount. Um, and this is really common in household goods like dishwashing detergent and laundry detergent, uh, cereal. This is where the larger the quantity that you're purchasing, usually the cost per ounce is less, uh, which means that the manufacturer is probably providing some form of quantity discount. This is good, and, and, and I put a picture here of cereal. You can kind of see all the different sizes. If you buy the family box, you might get more. Um, this is great because even though they're charging a little bit less per ounce, consumers are usually more likely to continue consuming that product in the future, and they're less likely to switch brands. If they keep buying it and they're stocking up, they have it in more, they're just going to keep replenishing what they have. Um, Another type of pricing tactic that we see here that's um, aimed sort of, sort of at consumers are seasonal discounts. This is pretty obvious. This is when the price is reduced on certain products just to stimulate a demand during an off-peak season. So this is whenever um, vacation packages are usually advertised in the winter, along with lawn mowers and barbecue grills. You know, you're probably not barbecuing in the winter or going to the beach or... Um, buying a lawnmower, <laughs> probably not mowing your yard in December when there's snow on the ground, right? So Lowe's and Home Depot and companies like that will typically advertise these seasonal discounts for things of that nature. Uh, we're also all familiar with coupons where you offer a discounted um, percentage or certain uh, dollar amount off of a specific item. We're pretty familiar with those. Rebates are also very popular for consumers. Um, Interestingly enough, manufacturers really, really, really like rebates as opposed to coupons because, believe it or not, 90% of customers actually fail to redeem rebates. They say, oh, yeah, I'll fill that out and mail it in, and they never do. So manufacturers are making a ton of money off this, right? Whereas retailers usually prefer coupons as opposed to rebates because they help increase demand in the same way, but they don't really have that handling cost of a rebate. So pros and cons there. Uh, we also see leasing as a pricing tactic, and this is very common. Um, you're probably, you probably think of leasing a vehicle, which is really the most common um, pricing tactic that we see. However, this is also becoming more common in today's world with handbags and uh, ball gowns and artwork. So uh, leasing is just where consumers pay a certain fee to purchase the right to use a product for a certain amount of time. Uh, they never really own the product. They're just leasing it. Again, I have a picture here of a car. So you pay $317 per month to rent this awesome Scion. It's good for 36 months, and you have $969 due at signing. So pretty simple there. Uh, another pricing tactic that we see is price bundling. And this is really common in my area here in the Tri-Cities with um, Charter. And I'll talk a little more about that in just a second. But this is where uh, firms try to sell more than one product for one single lower price and price bundling, okay? So again, with Charter, TV, phone, internet, um, they have this lovely special. You can pay $29.99 a month each for 12 months when they're all bundled. So meaning you can get the TV, um, the internet, and the phone all here for like $99, 100 bucks basically. Or you can choose to maybe just get the TV for $99. Or, oh, you want TV and internet? Okay, well, that'll be, you know, $150. Or, oh, wait, why don't you just bundle and get all three and we'll give you $100? Uh, just trying to, and you probably wonder why they're doing this. Well, the reason why, they're trying to get you to either encourage a trial of a new product, which with things like this is less common. The real thing is they're trying to incentivize you to purchase a less desirable product or service so you can obtain a more desirable one in the same bundle. But really they're tricking you because if you go ahead and you purchase charter television, but then you want internet through someone else, you're, you're paying two people, right? So they want to sort of incentivize you with this lower cost so that you'll stock up and you won't purchase from any competing brands. You'll get it all from charter and they, they kind of get all three here. So price bundling has become more and more common in today's society, particularly with things like cable, internet, phone, 
Uh, not that anyone has a home phone anymore, but you know. Um, okay, moving on to leader pricing. I have a joke on here that leader pricing kind of fuels happy hours at restaurants and bars all across the country. That really is true. Um, leader pricing is just a tactic where we try to increase traffic in the store by aggressively pricing an item um, and advertising a regularly priced item as well. So one example here is um, Sonic's milkshakes. So during the summertime, all of their other items are all regularly priced, but their milkshakes are always half price after a certain time, usually eight o'clock here in my area. So leader pricing here, uh, they're really trying to um, you know, capture you as a consumer, and they usually sell it alongside a higher priced item to kind of make up the difference. So, you know, when you're buying ice cream, maybe you also want those awesome mozzarella sticks from Sonic. So you have that complimentary item that, you know, the mozzarella sticks are regularly priced. That's going to make up the difference on what they're losing on selling these milkshakes at half the cost. I don't know about you. I'm one of those weird people who likes ice cream in the winter, and I'm always devastated when I have to go to Sonic and pay $8 for a milkshake when I'm used to getting it in the summer for $4. So big difference here. Um, another pricing tactic aimed at consumers is called price lining. And this is common um, in the clothing industry. I used Brooks Brothers as an example here. Uh, this is where a marketer sort of establishes a price floor, meaning the lowest price, and also a price ceiling, the highest price, for an entire line of similar products, okay? And they do this to help target different consumers in different market segments, okay? So thinking about Brooks Brothers, they offer the standard non-iron shirt for about $92, a dress shirt for $92, okay? And they also have, that, that would be our price floor, 92. They also have a price ceiling of $278 for people who want to purchase a luxury uh, dress shirt. And they have somewhere in between on $185 for an Egyptian cotton shirt, okay? So price lining is uh, helpful, helps set these different uh, levels to target different types of consumers. So these are all of our pricing tactics you can see displayed here. These are the ones aimed at consumers. We also have some pricing tactics that are aimed specifically at businesses. We're going to talk about some of the most common ones, but uh, one that I see a lot is seasonal discounts. Um, and this is not a seasonal discount in the same way that we saw with the Halloween candy. Okay, this is a little different. Rather than happening after the buying season, it usually happens before. So whereas like with Halloween candy, it all went on sale uh, right after Halloween, right? Well, here with businesses and seasonal discounts, they try to offer an additional reduction in cost uh, if you'll stock up a little earlier. So Linux offers an additional seasonal discount on air conditioner purchases. Um, prior to the hot summer months. So if you want to stock up on those air conditioners in January or February, um, you're going to be doing really well. You can get a seasonal discount, and you're going to be great whenever you have to sell all those in the summer. The problem is there's a lot of costs associated with carrying that extra inventory for a larger period of time, which I'm sure all of you accounting majors have studied that in great detail. Um, but there's a lot of extra costs associated with that. So seasonal discounts for businesses are common uh, but risky. Um, funny little meme for you here to enjoy. Um, we also have cash discounts for businesses. Um, and this is where you get 3% off within 10 days net 30. Okay, so this is the, the terminology, the mathematical terminology we use to display this. Um, this just means that we're going to reduce the invoice cost for you if you pay your invoice uh, prior to a certain period. Okay, so in this case, with what's written here, um, the buyer of the product can take a 3% discount on the total amount of the invoice if uh, they pay within 10 days of the invoice date. Okay, otherwise the full amount is due within the next 30 days. Okay, so 3 slash 10 in slash 30. Represented meaning you get 3% off if you pay within 10 days. Otherwise the net amount is due within the next 30 days. Okay, uh, this is great because even though they're offering a discount to businesses, it really does help firms because they get their money back earlier, meaning they can either invest the money to earn a return, or maybe they don't have to borrow money and pay interest on it for other things they need to do in their business. So uh, this can be a, a positive solution for a lot of people. Um, we also have allowances, 
and allowances just lower the final cost to channel members and there's two different kinds of allowances we're gonna look at today we have advertising allowances which essentially just offer a price reduction to channel members if they agree to feature the manufacturers product in their advertising or in their promotional efforts so hey we're gonna pay you we're gonna cut this off the price if you put uh, our us in your ad that kind of thing uh, we also have slotting allowances and this is interesting slotting allowances are sometimes viewed as a form of bribery uh, it's almost like you're paying the retailer so that you can get some form of preferential treatment in regard to product placement but typically with slotting allowances we see fees that are paid to retailers um, usually simply to get new products into stores or um, just to gain better shelf space for their products. So you can see here on the next slide I have a picture of a grocery store with all these different products. It's not uncommon for a manufacturer to go ahead and pay a little extra so that they can get um, better better position products in the store. Uh, we also have what are called quantity discounts um, and I think this is pretty self-explanatory um, but this is where you receive a reduced price according to the amount that you're purchasing. Uh, again, pretty self-explanatory. We have two types. We have the cumulative quantity discounts and non-cumulative quantity discounts. A cumulative quantity discount is um, usually where we set a certain specified period of time um, and we look at your transactions over that time and then we give you the discount later, okay? So this is really common with car dealers. So they might have a um, period, a time period of one year that they're looking at, and they might have to sell so many vehicles and purchase so many from the manufacturer and sell all of those vehicles during this time in order to get this discount on their purchase. And this is why at the end of the year, you might, that's sometimes it's the best time to buy a car uh, because you might find a car dealer that's going to take a loss um, on, on that year, on that quarter, maybe just to make a sale so they can meet their quota and get that cumulative quantity discount. We also have a non-cumulative quantity discount, which um, is commonly expressed in terms of a dollar amount. So uh, maybe you get 40% off the MSRP if you place an order of $500 or less, whereas between $501 and $4,999, you get a 50% discount. And anything over $5,000, you're getting 60% off. So uh, this is sort of used to incentivize the buyer to purchase more merchandise immediately. So again, you got to think about the cost of storing that inventory. This is very common. Uh, the last pricing tactic addressed to businesses that we're going to talk about today is uniform delivered versus zone pricing. And when we look at uniform delivered pricing tactics, uh, by the way, both of these pertain only to shipping. But whenever we look at these uniform delivered pricing tactics, we are looking at a shipper, uh, a seller who charges only one rate no matter where the buyer is located. So whether you're in California or you're in Florida, we're going to charge you the same price to ship this product, okay? Uh, whereas zone pricing varies based on the geographical division of delivery area. So we look and say, oh, if we're shipping within uh, this many miles or this many states, we're going to send you, we're going to charge you this amount versus, oh gosh, we have to ship all the way to California. We're going to charge this amount. And oh my goodness, we have to go internationally to Hong Kong. We're going to charge you this amount. So um, zone pricing is based on geographical areas. Okay. Um, moving on. The last thing we're going to talk about are some deceptive and illegal pricing. If you take advertising, you're going to study this in detail, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, but we commonly see what is called puffery in uh, advertising and marketing, and puffery is exactly what it sounds like. We're trying to puff up uh, our business, and we're trying to sell a product. So uh, if you take a car dealer, for instance, um, you might see a car dealer puff up their advertising by saying that they have the best deals in town. Now, that's not illegal to say, oh gosh, we have the best deals in town because it's not deceptive, okay? A certain amount of puffery is totally permitted, um, but it is unethical to lie in advertising or to be totally deceptive and untruthful. So again, puffery, oh my gosh, we have the best deals in town. We're puffing it up a little bit. But deceptive advertising might say, oh my gosh, we have the lowest prices absolutely guaranteed. Um, the difference here in puffery and saying we have the best deals in town and saying we have the lowest prices guaranteed 
would be that one makes a very specific claim that might be untrue. Maybe you don't have the lowest prices. It's definitely not guaranteed. Um, whereas we have the best deals in town, uh, just a little puffed up, okay? So there's kind of a gray area here in what's accepted and what's not, but it's important to be truthful in your advertising. It can come back to bite you, as we're gonna talk about a little later. Um, I already told you about reference pricing with Kohl's at least 50% of the time. Your sales do have to occur at that particular price. Um, another tactic that's really common um, that I, I love talking about is the bait and switch tactic. Um, this is when sellers advertise items for a really, really low price without ever really having an intention to sell that product at all. Okay. Um, so an example here, let's say we're talking about, let's say that I work at Best Buy and I'm trying to sell a TV. Let's say that I have a Samsung TV and I have it priced for $100. Oh my gosh, great deal, okay? So I, the seller here at Best Buy, I'm luring in some customers with this super low price, $100 for this really low price TV, okay? So this low price TV would be the bait. Remember we call this the bait switch tactic. So We've lured in all of our little fishies or our customers with our to our bait here, our television that's super uh, crazily underpriced, okay? But when they get here, we're gonna aggressively pressure them into purchasing a higher price model, the switch, okay? So we're gonna get there uh, and we're gonna usually pressure them aggressively into buying this higher price model by disparaging the lower price item or comparing it unfavorably with the higher price model. Okay, or maybe saying that we just have an inadequate supply of the lower price item, even when we don't. Okay, so going back to TVs, they come in to buy a 55 inch Samsung TV, and, and I say, Oh my gosh, you do not want the Samsung TV. People are saying that it goes out all the time, there's all these problems. Oh gosh, it doesn't come with a warranty, you don't need that. So I'm disparaging that lower priced item. Or maybe I just flat out lie. Oh, you want one anyway? Sorry, I'm out. I don't, I don't have any left. Come back tomorrow. We might get a new shipment. I don't know. Ooh, but you know, we have this higher price model over here. We have this other Samsung TV and it's it's 65 inches instead of 55. Comes with a five-year warranty. Oh my gosh, it's great stuff. Um, you know, never have problems out of it. Oh, wonderful. I know nothing about TVs. I'm sure you can tell, <laughs> but... Uh, the point here is the bait and switch tactic. Okay, so you lure them in with the bait of the lower priced item. Really don't want to sell that $100 Samsung TV because it's probably not $100, but I've lured them in with it and then I'm going to lie and say I don't have any and I'm going to switch by trying to sell this um, higher priced item. Now, this is illegal, but it's difficult to prove because you can't prove the intention of the seller. Were they genuinely trying to help the person? Oh, you really need to buy this product or uh, were they just trying to make a deal? You don't know, okay? So it's illegal, but it is difficult to prove. So unfortunately, very common. Um, we also have what's called predatory pricing. Um, this is where a firm sets a price very, very low on one or more of its products, really with the intention of just driving its competition out of business. If I know that I can charge this price, eventually everybody's gonna switch to my product, and they're gonna get rid of everything. So let's say that I have internet that I'm selling, and I have a new company called Harrison Internet, and I wanna sell my internet for a dollar a month, high speed. Obviously, I'm probably losing money on that. It's well below my cost, but it's gonna cut Charter and Embark and Comcast and all these other companies out of that industry. They're no longer gonna be able to sell internet, and everybody's gonna to transfer to me, and they're gonna go out of business. That's predatory pricing. I'm a predator, okay? Um, we also have what is called price fixing. This is just the practice of colluding with other firms to control prices. We can either do it horizontally or vertically. When you think of horizontal price fixing, um, this is when competitors who produce and sell the same products or similar products and services collude uh, to kind of control prices. It really just takes the decision of price out of the market altogether for consumers. They really have no choice, almost like a monopoly. So an example, when the World Cup was going on, six different South African airlines all got together. They were the only options, and they said, oh my gosh, we're going to hike up the price of flights during the World Cup so that you have no choice but to pay this high price, and we're going to just bathe in these profits and really enjoy it. Um, so that's horizontal price fixing because all the competitors are working together to set a certain price. We also have vertical price fixing. 
And this is where parties at different levels of the same channel agree to control prices that are passed on to consumers. So this is when the manufacturer and the retailer might work together um, to sell merchandise at a specific price. Um, that's pretty obvious. And I hope this video has been helpful to you guys. I always try to make these just because I know when I took online classes, sometimes it felt like I never was able to connect with the professor or you know, I really didn't understand the content as well as I would have in an in-person course. So I'm a real believer in online instruction that it can be just as good of quality as an in-person class. And I hope that these videos are helping you feel like you're getting to know your professor, that you're really learning the content. And of course, if you have any questions at any point, feel free to reach out to me. But I hope you guys have a great day and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.